Hi. <laughs> Who are you? Hi, I'm Jake Archibald, uh, and I love the web. It's the safest platform in the world, and there's absolutely no barrier to entry. You just visit a URL, and you get content. So let's have a discussion on how we might screw that all up uh, with installable apps and permissions. Uh, first, to introduce the subject, it's Mozilla's very own Marcus Caceres. Uh, so do you want to get your laptop plugged in and start I'm up. making words happen? Go for it. All right, fantastic. So um, yeah, thanks very much for the very short intro. Um, I'm not going to talk about you know me. So you know, I work for Mozilla. I'm extremely interested in this area. Uh, I've been looking at it for a very very long time. Um, so install web web apps um, and permissions. The problem first up is that these are very related topics, but they're actually different topics. So I actually want to like talk about them separately. So when we think about permissions and like with the discussions that we've been having within the community, we're really like talking about, to some degree, we're talking about this, right? You know, is this actually just a straw man or is it like, is this actually a real problem? Is this actually happening? Is this something people are experiencing and why? So I'm just going to rush, like I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to like rush through all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> We do have models on the web for when we introduce new APIs about um, how we make a decision whether we want an API or not. So Adrian Porterfeld has actually a nice little diagram. I'm sorry, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult for you guys to read it. You'll be able to see it online. But it essentially has a very simple decisions where you can say, you know, um, for instance, can the action be undone, um, can actually be undone with minimal effort, yes or no? If it's yes, then automatic grant. If it's no, you ask another question about the severity and so on. And from that, you can basically you know, create an API and decide on the permission level that you want to give it. Then we have a different model, which is, for instance, with service workers and request autocomplete, where, <laughs> don't get excited. <laughs> um, so in that model is like, do you have an SSL certificate? And if you do, then you can access this API. So I'm not saying you know, these are good things or bad things. Do we need these things? Is this enough? You know, so this is like for the panel, like, you know, is that what we need? Like, why, where are we getting stuck? Um, we know, you know, for instance, for geolocation, we're kind of stuck because we can't really know if the permission's been granted before we actually make the request. And that's like screwing us. Like when we try to develop sites, that's screwing us because we don't know what's happening there. So we need to fix those kinds of things. <clears throat> so it's uh, 2014, uh, where's my, you know, where are my apps? Why can't I install yet? What the hell's going on? <clears throat> so it's interesting the problem is of installation because it's not just like, can we add the apps to the home screen? You know, there's in the sidelines also going on, you know, there's this whole package apps movement and also there's hybrid apps. So let's start with web apps very quickly. You know, are we installable yet? You know, do we have the right bits that we actually need? So I'm treating model view controllers as you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as the kind of embodiment of these concepts. Are we there with that stuff? Kinda. Like if I had to like give a, a rating to this, I would maybe give it like a, a C plus. You know, we can do a lot of really cool stuff on the web, but some stuff is really challenging. And you're gonna hear more of this, you know, throughout this today. Like we don't have a really good design language yet to express apps on the web. Um, you know, giving apps a name, very simple thing. You know, that's not really well supported. So we have title elements and, um, you know, but we don't really have the idea of a short name like you do in iOS. Um, icons is just like really bad on the web right now. We need to really work on icons. Display modes, full screen, fantastic. Are there other view modes that we, sh or display modes that we should be looking at um, for installable apps? Orientation, orientation it's like really bad at the moment. We're working on fixing that. We don't really have control orientation right now to lock orientation. Offline, we've all heard Jake, blah, blah, blah. All done. Yeah, all <laughs> done. But today, man, it's bad, you know? So I would give it a D or an F, you know? Um, a start page for an app, the place that you first go to, we don't have that concept. On, you know, so you go to a page, you, you, know, you go to an app, you leave, you come back, and you're like at the same place. That might be good, that might be bad. 
When you install an app, usually you want a place to go and where you start from. Um, so I have really tried to rush these. Navigational boundaries. So an app, when you install an app, like a native app, it has like a starting point and an ending point. You need to know when you jump from one app to the other. On the web, there isn't that concept. We don't have a concept of boundaries. You just follow links. And if those links look the same, essentially you're in the same app. You can be like a Google.com and like bounce from one app to the other, and you wouldn't even know where you are. So the only cues that we have are visual cues. Uh, in native apps, you actually have like actual boundaries that you know, physical, they'll call them physical boundaries that you know, prevent you from going from one place to another. Um, <clears throat> and the cues, the visual cues are very evident, and they're not there on the web, <clears throat> or at least in the installable web, particularly people who've, been, who've uh, tried to build for iOS. You've probably seen that. Like, if you try to navigate, it stops from navigating, so you have to like, hijack navigation, and so on. <clears throat> so I mean, total, oops, five minutes. Um, Capabilities uh, and integration into the system. So um, device APIs. You know, can web apps use, let's say, iOS's health kit? What about all the like Fitbits and things like that? What's going on? Why can't we do that? How do we get there? You know, and that integration into the OS, you know, into the task switcher and so on. Anyone who's like, you know, again, I'm going to like call out iOS. You know, you've seen that it doesn't really work. Like if you Add to home screen a website on iOS, and you like double tap, the screen goes black. It doesn't like remember anything if you leave. Yeah, you know, but at the same time, they've done really nice work. So if you add, so if you like enable geolocation, it will actually be in the privacy section um, with all the other apps, which is kind of cool. So there's like potential there. <laughs> so meanwhile, single page apps, you know, we've all seen them. <clears throat> Um, they were introduced really in, in iOS back in 2009. I did a little study, what's going on. I looked at you know the top 78,000 sites. I found 1,000, uh, nearly 1,100 that were looking at that were claiming to be installable apps. What I actually found that 90% of those apps cannot actually be used as standalone. This was of, of October last year. Um, of the 10% that were actually usable as installable apps, 28% uh, had significant limitations that didn't actually allow you to use those apps. 85% um, of those sites relied on hyperlinks, which meant that the whole process of installing an app was basically just facade, <laughs> so on. I won't go through the other details, but the story is kind of bad. We need to really fix this. Meanwhile, we have packaged apps. You know, they solve offline for us. You know, Firefox OS is using them extensively. Um, but they lead to proprietary app stores, which is not great. It doesn't scale. It's not really web friendly. And it, and it forces centralized control because you need to have a digital signature in order to install these things. Again, not great. So, but it's not the web, as people say, because you can't really link to them either. So we should really talk about that. And then we have the hybrid app. <laughs> so the hybrid app is an interesting beast. So, Seriously? <laughs> I was going to. <laughs> so the hybrid app, I, I actually wanted to find a beautiful, like, because the hybrid app you is failed. actually, I did. <laughs> I wanted to introduce it with that, but, you know, the hybrid app is, is, is I find it really interesting, and I, particularly in iOS 8, again, you know, I'm a little bit obsessed with iOS, <laughs> um, because they've made it really, really easy to take a web view like with Swift, and like you can just embed it, and you can inject just JavaScript. You can write your own APIs that talk you know, through a very simple communication channel between uh, Swift or, or um, Objective-C and JavaScript. This is like, for me, this is like super crazy cool. And you know, PhoneGap's been doing this for ages. You guys like worked this out ages ago. But the interesting thing is, so you get like the, you know this deep OS integration, including the permissioning, but you also get this ability to like you know forget Windows. I'm just going to focus on you know whatever system, and I'm just going to build plugins for that. And this pluggable model that leverages the web and the OS, I think like that battle's going to heat up. And I think like if all it's only going to be closed proprietary platforms, we're going to have a problem. So. Discuss, <laughs> basically. That's like, you know, in 10 minutes, the world. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Um, okay, so to, to field questions on, on that subject, uh, we, have, we have Marcos, who you've already met uh, from Mozilla. We also have Eli Fiddler, who works on uh, the browser and web platform for BlackBerry. Uh, we have Matt Andrews, who's done work with the uh, FT and Economist web apps and has done lots of exciting stuff with offline first on the web. We've got Chris Wilson, one of my, my colleagues at Chrome. Do you think it's fair to say we're chromantically involved? Of course. <laughs> as long as you're comfortable letting people know. <laughs> so Chris is working on uh, making the web a first class platform. Uh, and Brian LaRue, uh, a pioneer in uh, dragging the web onto the mobile uh, world via phone gap here at Adobe. So please do be part of the discussion. Please jump in using OnSlide. Um, it doesn't have to be a question either. You could be making a statement. Uh, yeah, please be part of the discussion. So OK, panel. Get yourselves into the receive position for the first question, which comes from uh, Sarah F. And so I'll, I'll paraphrase it here. <clears throat> Recently, The Verge announced that they are discontinuing their device-specific apps in favor of a truly responsive site. Is that a trend we should uh, expect to continue? And why isn't every app doing this? So Matt, you've, you've done stuff on, on the web. So, and it, it worked, right? So we, we've won, yeah? So all, all fixed. <laughs> uh, I wish it was that simple. Um, I hope that continues. Uh, that's what we've done. That's what The Economist is also moving towards. Um, yeah, I, I, but I think there's still, as, as Mark has showed, huge holes in the web platform that make that really difficult right now. So what, what troubles did you, did you have? So I think the offline, the F minus or whatever that got, uh, is probably the biggest problem. Um, at least for us, uh, but yeah. So Brian, Brian you, you, you kind of straddle both worlds of web and, and native. Uh, do we even still have to do that? I mean, it's done, right? I wish it was. Um, so I think it depends on your app content and what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve with that content. If you've got uh, something that's more text heavy and needs to be updated frequently, then responsive websites make a lot of sense. As soon as you start having interactivity that involves the sensors of the phone, uh, the web's kind of a ghetto. And then if you need that thing to be offline, you well know that that, that can be difficult. Trick is, uh, people always say that native is better at offline. I don't think that's true. Like this morning I was trying to get an Uber and um, you know, I'm with T-Mobile, so I couldn't, because um, effectively I was offline, even though it says I was online. <laughs> and Uber works really poorly when you're not online, and that's the case with a lot of apps. So I don't, I don't know that offline is actually a native advantage. It's just a programming style, and the, the web style just happens to be really hostile. Yeah, yeah, working with the offline stuff, I find that it's, the, it's only the very best of native apps that seem to do this stuff well, like very few of them. So what, what kind of stuff do you see people using PhoneGap for today? Like, they use it for all kinds of stuff they probably shouldn't use it for, and they use it for stuff that we don't expect them to use it for. The big trend lately for us has been um, probably in the enterprise, a lot of business apps are being built now. The, the, the larger corporations that are out there have invested all this money and all this infrastructure in the web, and then suddenly everyone's showing up with iPhones. And they've got a whole bunch of Java programmers in the back there slaving away on SQL, and they don't want to learn Objective-C. And they see Swift, and they're like, okay, maybe that's going to be okay, except for it only works on iOS 8, and it won't work on iOS 9. So Swift is probably not something you want to invest in if you're an enterprise. So they're, they're looking to the web technologies as a way to solve this. So that seems to be the place that we're finding the most popularity. So you're doing sort of similar things on, on BlackBerry, taking uh, the web stuff and, and appifying it onto that platform. Are, are you seeing the, the same kind of trends? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have our WebWorks platform, which is essentially a wrapper around Cordova, and a huge, huge number of apps for all BlackBerry platforms are written using this technology. Uh, I think it's compelling for application developers because lots of people have web skills. and you can argue semantics about what is the web and what, how is an app the web or not the web, but I mean, even if it's not online in a browser, people know HTML and JavaScript and CSS, and those technologies, independent of a lot of the other problems that we've talked about, have won in a lot of cases. Even apps that we consider native often have most of the app, or at least a huge percentage of the app, is a web view. App stores. Yeah. App stores as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is, is that why, because you, you mentioned before that people are, are, are building phone gap style things for, for stuff they probably shouldn't. 
Is well, that stalls why? I shouldn't have said that, but uh, <laughs> I can't take that one back now. So, like, for example, one of the big ones we see is, is games. We see a lot of people building games using web tech. And I guess, like, when you're a young programmer, when you're new or you're an amateur and you want to get into, into software development, one of the things that becomes really exciting is, is games. And so, you know, we've been saying for years, don't build a game with PhoneGap. That's a terrible idea. You need to, like, you know, have high intensive graphics and stuff. But it turns out in mobile that you don't actually need high intensive graphics and stuff, like Sudoku type games, like little card games, really simple 2D platformers and that type of thing the web is actually really good at and it's getting better. So like that's the type of thing where we're like, don't use PhoneGap for that, but people do anyways. I think uh, Dominic Danicola uh, has, a, has a point about that. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm just not as interested in using HTML and CSS and so on just as a programming language, right? Like there's all these technologies you can use C Sharp and you can use all these things that compile to whatever's native on the platform or, or get baked in. What I'm most interested in is how do we get it so I don't have to go through Apple and submit to their app store and go through their review process and, and like, because because I don't want to just use the web technologies, I want to get all the benefits of the web. Uh, I have an answer that I can give you when I'm not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so right now your only choice is add to home screen, right? You can build a single page app or, or even a not a single page app if you're hijacking links and, and doing horrible things like that. Um, and that, that's your only choice. And I think the, the spec, the manifest spec, will hopefully improve that. So I mean, that's the, the hope from on. Um, so yeah, the, the manifest spec is attempting to address that. So it's trying to like, those things that I mentioned before, that list of like things that we need, it's trying to address those things. And, but again, it requires you know, everybody to get on board. If we can't get all yeah. the browser vendors on board, then it's like, you know. So who is on board then? Chrome, <coughs> Opera, Mozilla? So Chrome, Opera not explicitly, but they may get it straight from Blink. Um, you know, who knows about Apple? Microsoft has like, kind of said, yeah, we're kind of interested. It looks kind of cool. But they've never, they haven't committed to anything. So uh, can we get a microphone to Matthew Hoffman? Do you want to ra raise your hand wherever you are over there? Uh, and Andrew, I don't have a screen with that on here, so it's kind of difficult for me to see who's in the queue. I don't know if that's solvable. If not, don't worry about it. So I think uh, one of the problem of uh, web apps on uh, mobile is that they cannot actually integrate fully with the uh, native UI of mobile uh, that mobile platforms provide. So it's two islands, really. And you can call in some features, but you cannot like, show anything coming from native inside your web app island. What, what, do, you mean, sorry, what do you mean in particular? Any, any, uh, like you could any, uh, uh, any contents, uh, for example, video produced from native, impossible. If you have um, UI elements that you want to make your web app feel more native, uh, you cannot do that either. Um, so you, you can leverage sensors and all that, but you cannot uh, build something that looks and feels native in a web. So can I bounce to Brian here? Because like, you know, PhoneGap, you're targeting cross-platform. And I would have imagined that, you know, if you're actually build, or if you're building an app, you want it to have more or less its own look and feel, you know, of course, leverage what you can from the, from the OS, but across the board? The first six months of PhoneGap's life, we definitely experimented with plugins, which would abstract out uh, user interfaces so that you could do things like invoke a tab bar. Um, those metaphors got really leaky, and they broke down super fast, and you probably have seen that if you've used any kind of, like, compile to solution. So, like, a tab bar on iOS is the same as a tab bar on Android. On iOS is usually on the bottom, and Sometimes the iOS one has like bevels and embosses. Not anymore, but it used to. And so then you'd end up having to like kind of reinvent CSS for this damn tab bar, and you don't want to do that either. Because there's already CSS. And so, I don't know, the web has sort of shown, and there's lots of you know, projects out there that demonstrate that you can build native-like interfaces. And I say native-like, I won't say native interfaces, but like Ionic, um, Polymer with material design is actually looking really good on Android. Um, maybe not so much on iOS 8 yet, but soon it will, I'm sure. So I don't, I don't think it's actually worth pursuing. Like we could, do, we could waste our time trying to like paint over Android's UI and iOS's UI and then create some kind of universal UI that everybody opts into and loves and is native. 
or we can just do this stuff ourselves with the web primitives. And I think the extensible web manifesto type discussion later will touch into that a lot more. Like we need these lower level paint kind of ideas so that we can build these proper user interfaces. I think native interfaces themselves, the abstractions are just too leaky. If you want to build an iOS app and have it be native, pick up a book on Objective-C. I know some of the custom layout stuff, that's, that's going to come up in the, in, in the performance, the, the layout panel as well. Uh, can we get Dominic a, a, a microphone and we'll wrap up this question? Yeah, I just wanted to share an interesting point that we ran into on the, the Polymer team. Like, when the material design stuff came out, I remember one of the, like, we were seeing articles where it's like, oh, how is, is the paper element, the custom element, close to the Android version, as if the Android version was canonical. Uh, but really, the team was asking, like, why does everybody think the Android version is canonical? We, it might as well just be the case that the, the version we're putting out for the web is canonical, and you should be comparing to that. So. I, I, I kind of agree that maybe it doesn't matter, but also it's like uh, the web is a first-class programming platform for all these things too. So I thought that was interesting. That, that, that kind of leads nicely into into the next question, or, or certainly in terms of maybe not uh, taking Android's lead on things. Uh, so this this question is from Andrew Betts. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, he says the web model uh, of granular on-demand user consent is the only sensible way of doing app permissions. Why do app packaging systems rush to destroy that model in favor of the broken upfront permissions list? And I have a lot of sympathy for this, because I know on, in the Chrome Web Store, uh, when uh, TweetDeck's there, and there were a series of user reviews saying, I don't trust this, because when I go to install it, it asks to be able to tweet on my behalf. Um, I don't want to do that. That sounds crazy. But, but people didn't realize that when you type in a box on TweetDeck and you hit tweet, TweetDeck is tweeting <laughs> on your behalf. That's what it's doing. And if it asked for permission at that point, it would, it would make sense. So um, Chris, uh, Google uses this upfront model for Chrome apps and Android. Why do we keep getting it wrong? I, I, think that <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a decision you made, actually, personally. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think the reason why we keep doing this, and I won't say it's wrong necessarily, um, the reason why we keep doing this is it's seductively easy. Like, you, you just pop something up. Yeah, 90% of the users may not actually read it. 99.999% of the users may not read it, but they click OK. And then from the app's perspective, they get to do whatever they, they needed to do. They get to do whatever they want. This is not really good. Like, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. And I think that we are trying to do this better. Right? The, the, uh, the flow chart that Marcos put up on, on the screen earlier is a smarter way of thinking about how you should be doing some of these permissions. And I think for for web applications, we will have to do much better. Because you know, I started reading some of those things on my native apps. And I stopped installing a bunch of apps because they <laughs> wanted to do crazy stuff. And particularly on iOS, you, know, you get a bunch of, uh, you, they've started separating these out where you can like, not get notifications, for example. And um, wow, the little notifications, I am just obsessive enough with the little numbers on every icon hmm. drive me batty. Like, I can't stand having numbers popping up all the time. So I just disable every application, even the ones that I might care about yeah. because of that. Would it be, and we do it at Google Plus as well, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. yes. Would it be too much to ask to have both systems so that apps that clearly needed loads of permissions could ask for them up front, but ones that, like TweetDeck, maybe you'd only need to ask for the tweeting see, one when you actually want to tweet. That, that's kind of the wrong model, because apps that need loads of per permissions Every app is going to say, I need loads of permissions. Then. But hopefully they need. would care about their users, and their users would complain. And they would change you're, that. You're, yeah, you're we would on do people that. caring about things. I think experience shows that that's not how it works. So if you give people that, that foot gun, basically, they're going to use it. Yeah, I, I, I think, absolutely. I users don't really there. complain about upfront permission dialogues. They complain a lot when their flow is interrupted. They do. I think, though, that the, the smart bit here is we need to not just say, every time you need a permission, pop a new dialog. It's like they need, and an app developer needs to intelligently say, wait, I need to be able to do X. And I can now explain to the user in a, turn, in a way that they're going to understand at that moment why I need to do that. Like TweetDeck, for example. Instead of just having TweetDeck wants to be able to tweet on your behalf, it should be able to say, hey, we need to post to Twitter when you type stuff into the box. Hmm. Like, just click OK, and we know we know we can do that. Or some, hopefully not click OK for every permission, but something where they can explain why they need that ability. Yeah, can we get a, a microphone to, to Jonas? Put your hand up. 
Um, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you, you made the comparison to terms and conditions, because I, I, that's a, a model that we know doesn't work. Exactly. But we still do yes. it to, to use yes. it. Yes. Exactly like the, like the EULA. Well, that's I mean. like the, the source code of the law. Yes. And we still present that to users. I, I, I kind of wish that, that we could, if we detected a lawyer, visiting one of our sites, we should just serve up the raw source code. If they expect us to read their source code, they should make read ours. We can make that happen. Yeah, so a couple of comments. Um, first of all, uh, there is people are talking about sort of the web versus packaged apps and how packaged apps have these properties of like upfront security permission prompts and so on. And there's actually no, um, we don't have to tie packaged apps to these prompts. Uh, in Firefox OS, we've built, we, we use exactly the same security model as the web of, first of all, try to have as few prompts as possible, like design APIs so that you can do stuff without actually impacting security. Um, but then for APIs like geolocation, where we do want to prompt the user, even for packaged apps, we just follow the normal web model and we ask for permission in context. And so if there's a TweetDeck app that needs to um, to do some special stuff, then it can ask that like at the time when it needs to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and what we've found is that um, there's two things that are important. It's, it's very important for applications. Like the, the context of asking at the time when you do it helps users a lot to understand why this happens, but also um, enabling applications to describe why do I need to do this because many times this can sort of look shocking, but when you actually get a chance to talk to the user, like, why do you need to read my contact list? Uh, or why, why do you need to? Um, so, so what kind of things does Firefox OS use upfront permissions for? We don't use upfront permissions upfront. for anything at all. Uh, what we do, uh, so Firefox OS makes a distinction between uh, security questions and privacy questions. And what we've decided is that, generally speaking, asking users security questions is, is a bad idea because most people, uh, it's, it's hard to relate to them and to, uh, to understand what they're actually about. So asking a user like, do you want this app to have TCP socket access? Like, that means nothing to people. Well, that, that, that leads on to something, um, it, it was a very similar question that was on uh, by Cornell saying, yeah, are we asking too many technical questions of users and then blaming them for picking the wrong answer for things like sockets or you know, do, do you want this to access something? People, we've trained people just to click OK. So even the web model, are, are we starting to break that with these two technical uh, decisions? Also, can we get a microphone to Adam Singer? If you raise your hand. Hi. There's a little bit bug there. I don't want to roll. But um, so talking about single page applications, uh, so routing is like a fundamental component of single page applications. So what could the web platform do better so it's more native experience for routing? Why would you have to? You know, why should we depend on a framework to handle our routing for us, which then makes us buy into a framework just to even develop a spot? Well, I, I've, I've actually done routing without a framework before. In, in fact, you click Is it fun? a request goes to the server, and it works, right? Right? <laughs> the web, yay? So, so there's, there's a missing, the missing bit is, I think, preloading. And preloading, and I mean, for me personally, it's like preloading the page that you're, you're potentially going to navigate to and transitioning to that page. And I think until we have those things, you know, until we can smoothly go from one page to another. IE5 used to have that. And it IE5. still does. Remember so, those awesome transitions? Yeah. And That's I think we need to bring sick. that. I think we need, I'm, I don't know if we need to bring that back, but I think we need to look at that again. And yeah. I think the IE team, you know, well, you, you were there that time. I have no comment. <laughs> because it wasn't like it was a cool feature. Yes, it was. Like you know, and it was an interesting feature. And I think we might need to like actually look at that again. Yeah. And I know like it's uh, Ilya Grigory Karam somewhere. Maybe not here yet. Um, oh, he's, oh, he's, he's over there. So I know like Ilya is working on you know the the pre-render spec. You know the ability to pre-render a page and then you quickly navigate to it and it's yeah. instantaneous. So that may help with the whole routing thing. So you don't need single page apps so much. Can we, can we get a microphone to Alex Russell wherever he's hiding? Oh, he's over there. Um, so so do you, what, what do you think transitions are going to give us then? What's the, what does well, that break? You could slide in a page. Slide it in from the left, slide it in from the right. But state gets blown away in the process, so. Maybe. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, guess you like, could, you could keep all your logic like, in index DB 
and then load it when the page. Um... <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> any, any answer that starts index DB is the wrong answer. <laughs> right, local uh, storage. No. <laughs> Hi. Uh, just a couple of comments. The first is that um, there is work, Marcos, to your point, uh, happening in Chromium right now about something called navigation transitions, which um, bring HTML uh, transition filters of your back, but for specific elements that pages want to send to other pages to transition through. Um, so that code, it, patches are landing now. So that's, a, that's a, not obviously a standard yet, but it's something that we're working on. Um, Similarly, patches have just landed in Chromium for manifest support, and um, the add to home screen, add to desktop uh, widget for your Chrome for Android is going to take advantage of those soon. Um, so that's a hopeful step in the next direction. And I think to the routing point, it's a very interesting one. Um, I'm hopeful, again, I'm one of the people who bang on about service workers because I'm working on it. Um, I'm hopeful that we, we can offload, in many cases, a lot of that to the client side without changing the model of how a single page is constructed. Single page applications are modeled because you often wind up having to rebuild URL structure afterwards. And what you sort of want is navigations to be hung off of URLs, but then to end up at the next page with it having a URL and a good UI. Navigation transitions plus service workers should hopefully give you a lot of that responsiveness without having go to go to the network and flash white in front of the user. Matt, when you were building the, the FT stuff, did you how were you handling routing? Were you using just normal web requests, or were you kind of hijacking that? So yeah, so with the web apps we've got at the moment, uh, it is listen to the clicks, look at the URL in the, in the, in the HF, cancel it, and then rebuild it in the, in the very front end of the browser. Uh, I've been playing with Service Worker and with the early kind of things in Canary. And you can move all that into kind of a, well, if the back end is your server and the front end is your website, like the middle end, sort of something that pretends to be a server. And that's much easier because although you do lose state between each one, you could store that state. Index DB is not great, but I mean, you could, you could do that. Um, but uh, there's something alive that lives longer than that page that you could, you could store state in. I know you're not supposed to store state in Service Worker, but you could do it. Um, <laughs> but, but the point is, you, you don't have to worry about the other consequences of having that state in, in the front end because you have the potential for pages to start interfering with each other. Uh, you have an advert on one, and that could break you know, something completely unrelated. So the nice thing about Service Worker is you get a, a fresh uh, instance of, of the browser page each time. So I think with that, we're going to move on to the, to the next question, which is actually my favorite question that appeared uh, in Google Moderator. Uh, and, and yes, that is this. Uh, angle bracket slash text area. Close angle bracket, image source Y on error prompt one. I'm going to direct this question at Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that came from little Bobby Tables. I, just, <laughs> I, I like that they've done this HTML5 style without having to quote their attributes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good style. XSS from the future. <laughs> um, well, we'll probably move on from that to the next question. <laughs> so. Uh, this, uh, this came from um, Cornell, who's, who's provided actually a lot of the, the really good questions for, for, for many of the panels, so you'll get bored of his name soon. Instead of asking for permissions for small things, can browsers instead infer level of trust from other factors such as usage frequency, whether it's from bookmarked or, or reputation of the domain? Chris, you're, you're Google, right? Um, should Google decide which domains get enhanced permissions based on oh, our ratings? Because that sounds absolutely. like the kind of thing the public was really love. Absolutely. <laughs> I, think, I think users will be as delighted with that as they are to get ads that are more applicable to them. <laughs> and I mean that completely. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that we already, in, in, some, in some ways, we already do similar things. Um, in that if you visit a page with HTTPS and it asks for access to the microphone, for example, the next time you visit it, we don't ask again. We, we cache that. We remember that you said OK, and it's a secure domain. Secure domain. Um, I, I do think that there are things in that question that make a small trickle of sweat go down my spine. Um, <laughs> So I won't say absolutely we should do all of these things, but I do think that being more intelligent about how we can infer trust from other things that the user has said or done, as long as we can have a, a clear, secure track back to the domain, I think that that's probably the right, the right future. Yes. So, um, so but we're than, several steps from there still. So rather than like a, a company deciding it based on ratings, if something like bookmarking was used as a, as a signal, is, is that something that, that sounds fair? 
Yeah. Bookmarking is used as a signal today. So if you if you save to home screen on iOS and then you launch it from the home screen, it can control mostly yep. every pixel of the screen. That's not a permission that we give to websites in the browser. Hmm. True. Is it what, what kind of permissions would we would make sense to sort of auto grant for something that was added to, to, the, to the home screen that, that wouldn't surprise a user that we granted that? I, I think that's a challenge because you know that's true. If you add to home screen, you get a bunch of extra rights. And I, I'll also say that I think add to home screen is the worst thing today because it's buried in every mobile OS that I've seen. Yep. And hard to find, hard to discover for average users. I mean, I, I think on, in Android, you have to click an icon that's not at all intuitive, and then it's like at the very bottom on my phone where it's almost getting cut off the screen, which seems really bizarre for something that I'd want to do. And as a user, it's not clear that when I click that, I'm giving additional rights. Like it means something other than stick an icon on my home screen somewhere. And that bit, I'm, I'm a little worried about how we explain that to users, that there is, it's not install, it's not this gigantic Android-esque, here are all the permissions that you're magically getting now, are you sure you're okay with that good kind of thing. But it is also, somehow indicates to the user in a, an obvious but way. This is like where Adrian's uh, like diagram comes into mm -hmm, play, because mm -hmm. like installing, adding to home screen and getting all the pixels is not, it's, a minor annoyance, we'll it is. say. Yeah. So there is that. So that maybe there shouldn't be a permission for that. So mm -hmm. again, so again, it's trying to find that balance. And I think the biggest problem we've got right now is that we've spent seven years teaching people uh, to install apps from the App Store. And we've spent seven years of people thinking that discovery happens by going to Play or going to an app store. <laughs> and there's no, what, I guess the closest thing we have right now is like Google would be the app store for the yeah. web. but. There's, not, there's no way for us to say, OK, this is a thing, and this thing's going to be on your device, and it's going to do things that maybe you wouldn't want it to do necessarily. So can we get and a microphone for Guy, by the way? We'll, we'll we, we've also spent you know, more than 20 years teaching people that everything on the web is totally safe. And right. don't worry about it. And now we're, as, as Jake said at the beginning, you know, now we're going to screw that up. As long as there's a little lock, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even without the lock, you can't do anything dangerous. Um, I just wanted to point out that the, there might be a difference between the permissions of what we're talking about. Uh, so sometimes there are security and privacy permissions and also kind of makes what trickle my down, down my spine to think that somebody would, that Google would determine to give my location away or something like that uh, based on usage. Uh, on the other hand, things like resources, you know, quota for local storage. If everybody started using local storage or the new service worker quota, uh, you know, there would be a problem for the agents. You know, when does the machine blow up and uh, uh, run out of space? Maybe things around um, uh, usability or accessibility, what gets loaded up first and things like that. So we might want to split, I guess, for, for certain, to me, the, for certain types of permissions we prompt for today that are more around usage and resources, it makes sense that the browser would infer it for privacy and security reasons, not at all. Yeah, so, so did, Marcos, do you, what, what kind of stuff does uh, Firefox OS give you by default if you're, if you're an installed app? Is there, is there anything in particular? So I'll be honest, I don't know too much about Firefox OS, because I mostly focus on the web. But we could ask Jonas, because Jonas is like, you know, what we'll are the most we'll technical we'll guys? Like, and then we'll go to so, yeah. Alex as well. So, um, so how, do you know how? I guess the question I'd ask is how, how are we? Uh, like, how do you handle things like disk space? Is that something that you give give the user for free? Yeah. So our design uh, policy has been: it, once the user installs something, you get to use resources as much as you want. You get unlimited access to resources. So that's things like CPU running in the background. Um, uh, bandwidth um, and and storing stuff to disk, um, and then you also get to annoy the user. So things like uh, notifications will let you do without any any prompts. Um, and the idea has been that we give you the, the users all of these things, or we give applications all of these things, but then we give tools to the users so they can dial it down if they want to. Mm -hmm. So users can say like, this is a very annoying app. I'm gonna turn off notifications for it or just uninstall it. So, so should we do the same on, on the web for add to home screen? Same, same style permissions? Oh, I mean, I would say yes. Like, if you're going to do that, then integrate it into the system as much as possible. So I think it's. But, but if, if. Firefox so that, OS that worries also has me just three layers it seems... of apps, though. There's implicit onboard 
you know, blessed apps that get full system access. Then there's like, you know, installed apps uh, from the wild, and they don't get right. full system access. Isn't that the case currently? Like, there's what? two th hosted. two layers of there's yeah, hosted, well, hosted apps. Hosted apps, certified, and uh, yeah, we we have we have three levels. We have the yeah. certified apps that are built in. Um, we have privileged apps which have to be signed and reviewed by the Mozilla Marketplace, and then we have normal web apps. So that, um, that's the same as, well, it's not the same, but it's similar to Apple's security model. There's a curation process, which is, right. I think this is the thing that the web community is like most adverse to. You know, yeah. We don't like the idea that there's a central place where someone gets to curate, effectively yeah, censor what, what other people get to see. And at the same time, we don't want uh, My Little Pony apps turning into the gambling porno app uh, <laughs> overnight. Well, even more than My Little Pony apps, which my daughters would love, uh, you need the, the ability to have some kind of insight into where your disk space is going. Right? Like, particularly when we're talking about mobile devices, that storage is still a somewhat limited quantity. And I don't want every application to think, yeah, it's totally cool to dump 100 gigabytes of stuff onto my device. Because it may not be, but at the same time, there are certainly applications that I want to be able to store 100 gigabytes of you know, game data or whatever and keep it there and don't just arbitrarily dump it out of cache so, so because the, you need some. We've got, we've got the quote for API. I, I, Mozilla's not too keen on that, right? Uh, not that I know of. But the thing is that you, know, you can handle that thing in different ways, right? Like you know, there are the signals you can use, the way you don't need to annoy the user. You can annoy the user if you want, but you don't have to. Then there are other places where you can go within the device to actually see which app is actually using up how much space, which yep. is what happens in Firefox OS. And so there are various ways to manage it that don't actually have to like have an API bound to them. Mm -hmm. You know. So, so Alex, do you have something to say? I mean, you're you're on that screen, but not that screen. So do you have something to say? Again, two things. Um, so the first is that uh, I think between Marcos and Jonas, we've identified a really interesting split between sort of the web-centric view of what it means to have a permission uh, sort of ambiently granted, and then sort of the trust level view of what it means to have a permission granted. And um, I think even inside of one organization, you see multiple opinions expressed. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do now in the design of new web APIs is to make sure that v and vendors, even inside the same organization, uh, can, well, different vendors and even inside the same organization can express different policies without having to agree on different APIs. So one of the things that I think people get very bound up in is exactly what the UI for a particular policy is going to be. But if we make these requests for permission asynchronous, we make it the developer's problem in some level to deal with. And I think that's one of the big ways out that we can evolve through, because we don't have agreement yet. And getting agreement is going to require experimentation. The second side of this um, is that uh, it's one thing for Google to sort of you know, automatically intuit who should have what permissions. And I think that sounds very scary to everyone, including me. Uh, but we don't necessarily feel bad about Google running the safe browsing system. And so the idea that we're going to be able to hit control Z and keep users safe once we acquire um, some knowledge of abuse is very different to the idea that we're going to mediate upfront permissions outside of the user's intent and outside of the user presented model of what they think is going to happen when they decide to keep or install a particular thing or agree to a particular pop up. Um, so it's we good, and we should surface button. a bunch of the, the UI for m mediating these permissions once they're granted, but I think we need to. Re Keep in mind that it's more important to be able to hit Control Z than to mediate the upfront thing. So, uh, uh, Chris uh, Messner, are you your, oh, you got a microphone? Go for it. Test. Okay. So, um, you know, you guys are sort of taking a, a look at this from the current sort of state of technology, but we're on the cusp of user interfaces in particular that don't actually require pixels. So, whether it's a voice-activated thing, or you're in the car and you're driving. Um, you know, or there's shared interfaces where it's more of a collaborative computing experience, where, where does all of these problems go and how do you deal with that? Uh, what happens when there's multiple users that are authenticated? And again, like what happens when you don't actually have pixels to display with text for a user to read? Um, what does that look like? I think that's you know, one of the reasons why this model where you can, the, the developer is more in control of when they ask the question, when they say to the user, hey, I want the ability to do x because y. I think that lets you build applications that have that sort of thing, where 
you know, you don't necessarily have a screen all the time to look at things. Now the question of like, if you never have a screen, I think that becomes even harder and then it's sort of, well, what is that locked to? Like, at some level, do you have to have permissions that are read out to the user um, if it's a, a voice interaction system? Probably, unless you've locked it to some set of apps up front that are pre-authenticated, in which case, you know, you're good. So, uh, yeah, with that, we're going to move on to the, to the next question, uh, which comes from me. Uh, assuming we fix offline and installability, like all of these problems are solved, uh, Sweet. Yeah, great. But, but how do we get Latte. people to expect them to, to, to work? Like, how, how, how can a user expect the, the, the web to work offline or, or have these enhanced capabilities? Jake, what do you think? I have no idea. That's why I put the question here. I was hoping we could sort this out right now. I don't think anybody's figured this out yet, including native apps, right? Like, we're still having a lot of trouble. You can't install an app unless you are online, which is something people seem to forget a lot. But, and now once you've got that app installed, like, you know, even Twitter thrashes when it's starting up. It's like, oh, what am I doing right now? Am I, am I loading new stuff or am I, am I showing you stuff that you already had here? You have a noticeable, like, three-second delay with Twitter, which is probably one of, like, top-used apps on everybody's phone here. So it, what's it going to look like? I don't know. Not that. But, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> like, maybe this is the developer's responsibility. Maybe this is... Not, you're a developer. Well, not, not, the, not the browser's <laughs> responsibility, developer. our responsibility. Because it's up to us to make a good experience, firstly. And there's no point shouting, it works offline, if when people actually come around to using it, it doesn't. Yeah. So, so how did you handle that in the DFT case? Uh, so, well, we just shout about it. You know, it's, it's on all of the adverts for all of the promos for it. I mean, if you've ever visited DFT.com on your mobile device, you get a big irritating thing that comes up and, and says, excuse our app, because that's what you'd want to do. Um, yeah. Did you, did you do? Did you find users actually using it offline? I guess it's it's difficult to do analytics on that. <laughs> uh, no, we have analytics on that. We have analytics on that. Uh, we we if all the data that we get when people are offline, we store in local storage and then oh, cool. baking it back when yeah yeah. You did do it. There are some com <laughs> subtle Google complexities it? with that, but yeah, I think like twenty percent of traffic is offline uh -huh. um, or something like that. That was a, that's quite an old stat, so it might be different now. Um, but yeah, people people use it. People complain when we break it. Um, which happens sometimes too. So, Eli, was the um, I, I so I, I know more about the state of iOS apps and, and Android apps. Is, is do the majority of BlackBerry apps work offline? Do you find that the, the ones that are sort of built in the Cordova way are they offline capable? Is that well communicated to the user? Uh, I think a lot of them are available offline. Um, obviously, app developers don't always do a good job about this. Even top apps often don't do a good job about this. But uh, for the Cordova style case, there's something fundamental about the technology that makes it that hard to implement something that works offline. In the browser, that's a different problem. We know that there's lots of issues with the technology there. But we know that users don't expect their browser to work offline, even if it could today. If you hit the browser icon, like, people so don't expect if, that. If we did try and users to expect it offline, they'd be disappointed a lot. Because I think most websites, no matter how much we say it's possible, most websites won't bother to do it. But I think we train users today that native apps work offline, and I'm frequently disappointed then yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So you're saying like, the Cordova stuff doesn't work offline? Well, is that no, it does. It does. <laughs> yeah, and the technology makes it work offline, so then it's up to the app developers. So this actually keyed on something that's been bugging us a lot lately. So the way Cordova works today, we load off the file protocol. So anything on file colon slash slash, we just load it. And then WebKit has this awesome feature, maybe a bug, um, that it's there's no content security policy on file colon slash slash. You can load anything from any domain, which is kind of rad. Um, <laughs> in iOS 8, Marcos talked about this, there's this new web view. And in iOS 8, we can't load off file colon slash slash. And it's a bug, and it's marked in radar as a bug. So Cordova's not going to get to use the new WK web view, or at least that's what I think they thought and we thought initially. But we found that there's a workaround. And interestingly, we've had this workaround for a while in our Android. Uh, world where we run a web server on the phone. Uh, I know everybody's like, what the fuck are you talking about running a web server on your phone? It works. And so we can load off a local host, but now we're running a full-fledged web server as a part of our app on the client. And that's got implications that I totally don't understand yet. I know Opera did it first, if there's an Opera guy here. Um, but 
<laughs> it's, it's interesting. And so I don't know where this goes, but this changes the whole offline question altogether now because now I'm running a fully capable web server on the device as well. It should have just been like a proxy server, and then you could have called it service worker, and then we could put it in the browser. <laughs> and yeah, well, it service worker is kind of like a web server-ish yeah. interface on a phone, too. So we're, we're entering in this world where there's web servers everywhere. Maybe we will have that distributed computing thing happen. Uh, OK, next question. Yeah. That <laughs> uh, really killed, yeah, really this killed the conversation. No, oh, no, it's more the next question, not this question. Uh, so recently, uh, this comes from Andrew Betts as well. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, recently, Chrome experimented with hiding the URL. Uh, is this another step in the appification of the web? Yeah, because I wrote a blog post about this when uh, you know, Chrome had that experiment where they were hiding, hiding the URL. And it landed on Hacker News, and the internet fire hose was pointed at me, and it was filled with fire. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fun blog post to look at. So uh, Chris, why does Google hate the web so much? <laughs> I feel like I'm really picking on you, but I didn't want to show bias. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you've succeeded in not showing pro Google bias <laughs> in, in this. <laughs> so, but it's I mean, Brian, like the phone gap apps, they they don't we don't they show don't have URLs. So URLs are right, they're pointless, right? They're dead. You, you hate URLs as well. I. Uh, <laughs> There's problems with URLs. I, I, can, I can argue that. Uh, if you've played with Opera's Coast Browser, uh, I don't know why I'm giving Opera so many props, but whatever, they're good. Um, they do good work. So Opera's Coast Browser has no URL, and it's surprisingly nice to navigate and play around with, and I totally recommend checking it out. Um, the, the URL is not going away, so that thing will be there for a while. Uh, whether or not we have to show that to a user is fully up for debate, and it should be. Like, just because the URL is a great idea doesn't mean the users have to know that it's there. Um, that's my belief on it, but that's obviously firehose material, so. <laughs> well, you, you well, built with the web, so yeah. like, was the URL useful to you still in an in a app, web app? Uh, from a technical point of view, it's useful. I, I just want to say that um, no one complained, or no one I saw complained when Safari did this. It seems unfortunate that Chrome get the front of the it Anger. does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it really does. Um, but yeah, we, we, we rely on the URL. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make no, no, service no, worker happen quickly. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, you don't do it in front of me. <laughs> I'm getting it all wrong. Uh, so with, with, with the BlackBerry stuff, you, you guys hide the, the URL as well, right? We hide the URL for sites that have SSL certs that we are very happy about. So if you have an EV cert that we're happy about, we show you the uh, issuer name. That makes sense. What, 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 the or, so the organization name. So like if you go to Bank of America, you see Bank of America in green with the lock icon. I have never see. been to a bank's website where I could read the URL anyways. So it didn't yeah. well, but, it's like J session ID, but, whatever. But like. see, that's it. I think that you know, in, in response to what you're saying, you're saying you don't think URLs are going away anytime soon. I don't think they're ever going away on the web because I feel that's fundamental to what the web is. It's like linkable URLs. But at the same time, the idea that you can sanely read a URL, that time's gone. Like that time's been gone for a decade or more at this point, at least. Yeah. And it is all junk in there and you shouldn't read it, but it's still an identifier. It's still something that I feel like um, in how I internalize the UI of a web application, that's just a little marker, and it's totally opaque. It's like a, you know, it's a, a token identifier. It's a button that I want to press or something to go back to it, but it's not actually something I'm, I really need to see. We keep getting attracted to this idea of human readable. Like, remember when people said XML was human readable? Like, yeah. People used to say that, and and then they started saying, no, well, that's not human readable. JSON. You is. mean you didn't? Sit like, down, <laughs> you didn't sit down last night with a big tome of XML, just yeah. for just fun? Paging through it. God, this is beautiful. And Andrew's holding a microphone and looking eager. One of the biggest arguments for the hiding of the URL is the phishing thing, you know, that, that you want to avoid users being phished by hiding the bit of the URL that's least important yes. in identifying that the site is safe. And I think one of the biggest problems with that is that it doesn't actually work. Um, because, you know, you, you have a, a phone that is small enough that it can only display part of the host name. So what you've got to do is register a, an evil.com dot, you know, an evil.com which has a subdomain that looks legit and it has the same prefix as the one that you yep. were going to log into anyway. So I guess I don't buy it because I just don't see that the benefit actually exists. 
I mean, I, this is kind of what I was saying. It's like I need to I need to know that that token is mostly right. Like if I'm going to my bank's website, if I know that it says HTTPS colon whack whack www.bankofamerica.com and it's all green and it's you know got the Bank of America cert on it and everything, I, it's likely okay. But if I don't see the URL today, how do I know that that's where it's going? How do I know it's not going to evil dot, you know, or bankofamerica dot blah 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 dot evil dot com? Um, can, can we I get don't. Charles a, a, a microphone? Where, where are you? Put your hand, hand up. Great. Um, oh, well, that's very loud. Um, so uh, we've been talking a little bit about permissions, about installable. I know that we've got a question coming up about fragmentation. What happens if we start doing uh, applications? Uh, application installation, how that fragments, potentially fragments the web. Um, is this built okay. like this to you? Oh, that's not me. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking, um, and, and about uh, hiding the URL here, what, what happens if we look at browser vendors as app stores? Um, and is that, a, is that a future that is scary to us, having them sort of be trusted authority on permissions, um, on Chrome all of the things store. that occur when we install an application. Is that something, if that happens in the future, is that scary or is that good? It's happening. It, it I mean, has, it, it's it already has happened. Yeah. Like Chrome Web Store is kind of that, for example. But I'm not sure that's the model that we really want. I mean, it, like, I, I work on a browser. I've worked on other browsers in the past. And I still, I like the fact that they're somewhat interchangeable, right? I, I don't actually have a boatload of Chrome web apps installed on my machines because I, I like the fact that you know, I can use the web and I can use something that's like an app, but I don't have to install something that doesn't work if I go to you know, my iPad and I don't have all of that browser there. Are we also, as, as people who work on, on browsers, people uh, and uh, developers, are, are we all agreed to the, to, the, to, to the open web thing, like this idea of, of vendors controlling uh, which things appear in an app store? We're, we're all committed to never doing or to trying to rid the world of that. Yeah? I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm warm into it, so, and, and not, not to the current model. So I don't think, like, like, for example, there should be you know, these singular app stores. But I'm warm into the idea that there should be many app stores. And like Mozilla experiments with the idea of that, federating yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like many like, app stores I could get behind, although it becomes challenging to It's terrible, but like, that. for example, I trust Steve. I trust him. They have games, right? And I, I know what kind of permissions those games need. They need full screen, they need audio, whatever. And so like, I would totally trust a Steam app store on any of my devices. And I think that's kind of the direction we're going now. Can we standardize, federate, and open that part up is the real question. And then what, what does become of the web then? I think the, the web community is, is afraid of app stores rightfully because they're currently curation points that are centralized and dangerous and kind of weird because you have Steve Jobs deciding what, what's appropriate content. But, and, and He's and not even that, alive anymore, so how's that possible? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we, we are out of time for the session, but we'll be able to uh, continue discussions in, uh, in the breakout sessions uh, later on. So I'd, I'd like to thank, uh, thank all the panelists. Um, it's been scary and interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes.